Welcome to this session of Lightblade Learning Lab. Now we've already tackled all the main tools um, but to be honest today we're not going to really be using many of those tools because we're not going to do any drawing here in RD Works. As I mentioned to you before this is not a CAD program this is an interface program and any photographs or bitmaps that you need to prepare you should do that outside this program and import them as bitmaps or pings or something like that. Today we're going to work with vector files. Now most of my work is done in a CAD system where I export as DXF. That's just because I've got an engineering background. I'm not an artist. If I was an artist I would be working probably in um, Adobe Illustrator or something like that. But this system also handles Adobe Illustrator files which are vector drawing files. So I've already prepared some files and today I'm going to import them because we can't open them because they're not in this system already in the right format. So if you want to bring files in from an external system you always import them. And I'm going to be importing this thing called Beam Target. Now it's imported full size but it's not necessarily the page size. If we look at the table, there we can see, we can see these items on the table. Now we can see from this, look we've got two millimeter acrylic that we're using for these parts and yet we're using white card for these parts. Now we can't cut those both together so although I've got them on the same DXF file what will have to happen, we shall have to import the same DXF file twice. The first time we're going to import it we're going to be ruthless and we're going to delete that section. We don't want the text so we're going to delete that. We've got to remember that it's two millimeter acrylic and to be honest what that is that is a frame of the piece of material that I'm going to use to cut these items from. Now I'm going to move this job into the middle of the screen but of course that isn't necessarily where we're going to put it on the table when we actually cut it. This is just convenience for drawing and programming purposes. Now, the bits that we want are these bits in the middle here. The bit round the outside, which I've just highlighted, is in red. And I could possibly put that onto a different layer. And for convenience purposes, I will do that at the moment. Normally, I would just delete it because it's not necessary. But I want to show you another feature or function here while we're programming. So I'll pop that onto a blue layer at the moment and that blue layer I'm going to put it up here and we're going to have I've double clicked on that blue layer to open up this parameter window and it says is output yes or what no well if I want an output and I want this to cut then I would have to say yes but because this is the outside shape of the material that I'm going to be using I don't want it to cut. So in this particular instance I would answer that question no. And now everything else down here is just unimportant because I've said I don't want an output. So you can hide certain parts of the program if you wish by putting them on a different layer and then using this function here is output. So we're happy with that so we say OK and now we'll go to the black layer. Double click on it and it will open up the parameter window. OK now this is where we really start our programming. We've got to decide what speed and feed we're going to cut these parts out from. Now this is two millimeter acrylic. Now I've got 18 months of experience of cutting these materials but it is on a different machine with a different lens and that makes a big difference and I will explain that to you later on in the series. So for the moment just go with me I think I'm probably going to have to use around about 20 millimeters a second. I might be able to get away with 25 I can't say because I don't know what lens is in this machine. So the next question oh the first question there was is this output? Well we've already seen that yes we do need it to cut so we've got definitely got to answer that question yes. Now there's a question here which says is it says if blowing yes or no. Well it's a bit of a silly question 
And it's a bit of a superfluous question in a way because this is blowing, or if blowing, yes or no, is all to do with the air assist. Now, if you remember when we did our introduction, I said to you, please, please, please do not turn your air assist off. Make sure that your air assist is on every time you are doing cutting. And that's because we don't want the smoke to go up in the lens and disrupt the efficiency of the lens. We have the option here to turn this off with a solenoid in the machine and that solenoid is not in my machine and it's unlikely to be in your machine either because I don't think Think Laser would put that function in here. So instead of blowing, read air assist and generally leave the air assist on. I would never advise you to turn it off. Now we're going to go down here to the cutting processing mode. I'm not going to go into this advanced window here at the moment, we'll just keep it simple. And we've got several options in here. We've got pen, dot, cut and scan. Well scanning is for engraving and for bitmaps. Dotting is for mm, some rather interesting cutting facilities and pen I'm honest, I haven't got a clue. But we shall find out before we get down to teaching you about that. Um, so we're going to use cut because that's what we want to do, cut these parts. Power, well I've used a fairly a fairly high speed here because I'm anticipating using a fairly high power. Now I'm going to be using 65% and 65%. Now First of all, when you cut things, in general, you always use the same max or the same min and the max power. There are exceptions, but I'm not going to cover those at the moment. We'll keep it simple. 65% is maximum power. But I can hear you asking, but the machine goes up to 100%. Why can't I use 100%? You may remember back to the first session as well where I highlighted you have an ammeter on the machine and the ammeter basically gives you an idea of what power you're putting through your laser tube. Now I will go and explain a lot more about the laser tube in another session but at the moment just trust me that 65% is probably the maximum power that I can use and at that point in time I will have reached the 22 milliamp limit for the tube. I, I mentioned to you before, don't tick the default. If for any reason we get down here and we find this through power is ticked, untick it. We don't need it. So what have we set on there? We've answered a few simple questions and we've said okay. Now you might not believe it but we've virtually programmed the job. The only thing that we haven't programmed is the order in which we want these things to be cut. There are many ways of ordering things on this particular piece of software. One of the ways in which you can order them is you come up here to this layer and you can swap the layers over. So look I've pulled the black I've pulled the black layer underneath. Then there is no preferential treatment there for these layers. What will happen is the blue layer will cut first and then the black layer will cut second. If the black layer had scan on it, regardless of whether the blue layer is a cut, the black layer will be cut first because it's a scan layer and scans always take precedence over cuts. The layer order is absolutely useless if you've got scanning taking place, but because we've only got two cuts there, technically the blue layer, if it was a cutting layer, would cut first. Because it's not cutting, it doesn't matter. So I want to go to handle. And we're going to open handle up and I want you to come down here to cut optimize and there's a little window here which we could tick order of layer I mentioned that just now we don't want order of layer we could have it so that the parts cut from the inside to the outside hey now that makes sense because we do want the holes cut before we want the outside cut I'll leave it on for a minute because I want to show you something else. Start point optimize. It doesn't matter whether that's on or off. Um, this block handle, um, 
I can't answer your question because I've got no idea what it is. And then we get these directions which allows us to cut up from bottom to up, left to right, right to left, different ways of processing the job. I'll tell you what, let's do bottom to up. So we've made this selection at the moment and I've done nothing to these parts. Would you like to have a preview of how these parts are going to be cut? Let's do that. Up at the top here we've got a little television screen and if I click that preview screen we've got something here called a simulation. Now what I would do is I would put these sliders down in the first instance towards the bottom, maybe not very far down. The top one I would put that probably about halfway along and the bottom one I'd take it towards the start but otherwise things will happen very quickly. So we're going to do a simulation and let's have a look what this simulation does. Press the simulate button and then move your move across to the slider so that you can change the speed. Now look at the blue cross going down from the right hand side there and it's cutting the inside and now it's doing the outside. We could speed it up a little bit then it's doing the holes on the inside and it's doing the outside. Holes on the inside and then the outside. So everything's working well. And there we go. We've just proved that this job will run perfectly and I've had to do no more programming than that. So I can close this down with those settings, which are not my favoured settings, but with those settings, and you would notice that it started from the bottom and worked its way along and up and it worked from the inside and did the outside second on every one of these parts. That's almost as difficult as it gets to program these simple parts. The program's written. The only thing that we haven't done now is to get it into the machine. I need to plug in a memory stick to this PC, which I've just done. We need to come down here, as I mentioned before, and check that the device is on USB automatic. The one thing that we don't want on is something down here which could be on ticked path optimize. Leave the path optimize off, my advice. And then this position here, leave the current position on. Don't choose another one. And then we're going to save this. There's two things that you could do now. The first thing is if you're likely to use this file again, which is possible, we need to save it. So we can save as. Now you'll note that down here it says it's an RLD file. Now an RLD file is something you can save and you can open again and again and again. The file will be saved with all these parameters, the cut parameters, and so it's a preservation of exactly all the work that you've done. So I'm going to call this beam targets. And now I'm going to come down here to the save U file button to my removable disk and we'll save it as the same again, H-E-A-D-T-A-R, G. And that happy sign there, I think I might have mentioned to you before. Um, Chinese, that stands for, have a nice day. OK. Now we need to tackle the other item on this project. We will import the DXF file again. And this time we will be brutal and we will delete this part of the job. And then we'll take the time. Now, just remember that this is not acrylic. This is a white card. Now, before we delete the border, I just want you to note how relatively tight the job is to the material that's available. I shall mention that again when we come to set the job up on the machine. Just move this to a slightly more central position. As I said, it's for no particular reason other than just visual appearance and convenience. 
it's got nothing to do with how we're going to set it up on the machine itself. Here we've got some lightweight card targets that we should be firing the laser beam at. There are a couple of things I want you to note about this design. First of all, everything has got round corners on it on this target. Although these are ellipses for very good reason, um, I will explain that later on. They're not round targets, even though the mirrors are round, the targets are not round. When it comes to writing the program, we're trying to achieve burn lines only, scorch lines on the surface of the material, and then we're trying to cut round the outside shape. The outside shape, if we look carefully, right at the very top here, you'll see that it's not complete. The line does not go all the way round, and that's purposely done so that these pieces stay attached to the sheet of paper. They remain in there so that you can pull them off as you need them. So how are we going to achieve these two different power levels? One for cutting and one for scorching. The simple way is to put them onto two different layers. So what I'm going to do is put a marquee and watch carefully what I'm doing with this marquee. I'm just covering all the targets on line one and I'm now going to let the marquee go. And you'll notice all the targets have turned red. I didn't turn the outside shapes red because the marquee only covered part of the shape, the outside shape. To collect a shape, you need to cover it completely. OK, so we've collected all that line of targets. What I'm now going to do is to hold the Shift key down. And I'm now going to collect the second line of targets. And you'll notice that they've joined the first line of targets. Now I've still got my shift key held down and I'm going to do the same thing with the third line of targets. Okay, so now I've actually highlighted, collected, whatever term you want, all the targets. Now I'm going to come down to the bottom here and I'm going to click the blue layer and watch what happens. First of all, you'll note up here that we've created a blue layer at the top right hand corner. So what I'm going to do is double click on that blue layer, click click, and that will open up the cutting parameters. Well I said cutting parameters, in this case they're going to be scorching parameters. It's a bit of a difficult decision as to what speed we should run at, because I could put 500 millimeters a second in there, but it wouldn't change the speed of the head. Now let me just give you a little explanation that might help. I own a Ferrari, I wish I did. Um, and I live on a block that is about 200 metres square and I like to go racing around the block. Every time I come to a corner I have to put the brakes on, slow right down and go around the corner then I can put my foot down and I can accelerate like billio and off I go again. But no sooner have I got up to about 50 miles an hour and I've got to put the brakes on for the next corner. So owning a 150 mile an hour Ferrari has no benefit to me as I'm racing around this very, very small, sharp cornered block. Now, things would be slightly better if I lived on a 200 meter circular block, because at least I could get up to speed and I wouldn't have to keep slowing down every time I got to a corner. So that's the basic analogy that I want you to remember when you're doing laser cutting. Every time you get to a sharp corner, the machine has to slow down, stop, and change direction. If you put radius corners on your design wherever you can, and it's not always practical, then the laser will the laser will move smoothly around the corner without slowing down as much. So that's a very simple design principle which I'd like you to understand from the start, and hence the reason why I've got round corners on all these targets. I don't want the beam to slow down and burn through in places. I want the speed to be kept as high as I possibly can. Running it at 500 millimeters a second is a waste of effort because it just is never going to get to 500 millimeters a second. So I'm choosing a number of 200 and I think that will be fast enough to, um, to, to not burn through. Well, the first question is always, is output? Well, yes, we want some output. Um, so we've set the speed. Now we're going to this if blowing. We'll ignore that because that should be set to yes. Processing mode. Well, we've got two choices. We can either scan or cut. We don't want to scan because I will show you how poor Scan is at doing that particular job in later episodes. This is what we need to do. We need to have it on a cut. Bearing in mind we're trying to only scorch the surface, 
we need to have the power as low as we can possibly get it. Now I don't know on this particular 60 watt tube what the minimum power is I can use. It isn't 0% because if 0% is programmed in the laser won't fire at all. The laser probably won't fire until about maybe 8, 9, 10%, somewhere in that sort of region. So I'm going to set the power down to about 10% and we'll see whether or not that's enough. We can always edit these values on the machine and we'll go through that if we need to. So I'm going to set my max and min power to 10%. Laser through mode is unticked and that's it. We've only got two parameters to really set, speed and power. OK. Now we've got to work out how we're going to cut the outside shape. And to do that we're going to have to bring up, double click, 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 the black layer. Again, is output. This question is really asking, do you want me to include this item when I write a program? The answer is yes, we do want it in the program. Speed, I think I'll go for something like about 80 millimeters a second. And I'm going to probably use a power of maybe 20, possibly 25 percent. There's not, it's not an exact science. So what we've got to do now is make sure we get these things in the right order. We want to make sure that we scorch the targets first and then we cut the outside shapes second. Now I'm going to take you back up here to the handles and we're going to go to this cut optimize. Now we're going to have to adopt a slightly different strategy this time. There are different ways in which we could tackle this problem of how we're going to cut these. But let's stay with the cut optimize handle facilities at the moment and this time we're going to use the order property. We can untick this inside to outside because we've got two different powers that we are using. If we use the layer order we could ask for all the blue layer to be done first and then for the black layer to be cut afterwards and that's the sensible thing to do. It doesn't really matter how we have this set, whether we run top to bottom, left to right, up to down, it, it really just doesn't matter. And then again, the start position, the start point optimize doesn't really matter either, but we'll leave it ticked. We've decided to go for order of layer, okay. And now we've got to look up here at the black and the blue layer. Now, I mentioned to you before that the order of these layers is the order in which they will be cut, especially now that we've chosen the layer order as the option, the cutting option. So we don't want the outside cut first, we want the target to be scorched first. So we need to click on the black layer and drag it down below the blue layer. So we've promoted the blue layer to the top of the list so that it will cut first. And we can check what's happening by going up here to the little preview screen. Now my first question is why don't we have the targets on here? Well let's go back and have a look. Let's check the blue layer. Is output? No. Yes it is. Okay. Now we've fixed the problem. Let's go and have a look. And there we go. So you can see how useful this preview feature is. And we'll do the simulation. And now once we've got it running, we can start to speed it up to see where it's going. Watch the blue cross going down to the bottom left-hand corner. And there we go. Look, it's creating all the crosses. We can speed it up now quite considerably. And it's doing all the targets. And now we'll slow it down again. And if we watch again from the bottom right-hand corner, it's busy cutting the targets out. So we'll just wind the simulation up again, speed it all up. And there we go, 100% success. And now all we've got to do is first of all we've got to save this to a file, which I'm not going to do because you've already seen me do that. And then we've got to save it to a U file. Again, I'm not going to demonstrate that because you've seen me doing it. So we shall finish up at the machine to see if we can start cutting these items. So here's the piece of material that we're going to cut our parts from. Now there's probably just about enough material there to do the job so I don't really want to experiment with that. I have a piece of material here of the same type which I've used for another purpose and built into the machine here I have put already a 
40 millimeter test square which I'm going to use to just check the cutting parameters before we start doing the real job. Okay so we've got our 40 millimeter square um, in memory already so I'll just press enter and you'll note here that at the moment I've got the speed set to 20 millimeters a second and 65 percent power. Now that will be my first attempt. Now I'm going to drag the head very slightly towards the zero. Not that 40 millimeter square is going to worry me. We're now going to show you the startup procedure using the auto focus, which should automatically set the focus of whatever lens I've got in here to the right position. First of all we need to press the ZU key and that gives us all these options down here. Now right at the bottom of the list we've got auto focus. Now, sorry, before we start what I've got is something there called a Z move at the top. You would naturally think that if you want the table to go up and down you would press the up key to send it up and the down key to send it down. No, it doesn't work like that because as you can see the up key and the down key rotate you round the menu. Right, let's get back to Z move. To get the table to drop down you'll need to press the left hand arrow key and if we just watch with the left hand arrow key whoops that's a little bit strange they seem to be the wrong way around intuitively I would have thought the left key is a minus key and the right key is a plus key doesn't do that or an interesting point so we've driven the table down and we can drive it up and down manually now we're well clear of the uh, the nozzle I've got plenty of room underneath there so now what we're going to do is use these down arrow keys to get to right at the bottom of the list there there's something called autofocus. Okay, I'm now going to press the enter button and we'll see the autofocus working. It touches the switch, stops, backs off, and then it carries forward again. And then it backs off a little bit more. And that's the correct autofocus position. The autofocus switch is actually about six millimeters above the surface here. So we're ready to run my 40 millimeter test square. Now I can either drive the head around, or in this particular instance, because I've got the because I've got the cover open, I can actually set my material where I want it to be. Now remember, and I'll keep stressing this point, that we're working from this top left-hand corner here, and we should draw a 40 mil square out here. So just to prove the point more than anything else, what I'll do, I'll put my material on that corner there. Right now I could have driven the material, I could have driven the head to that corner, but I've moved the material to that corner. So let me now press something on the machine called the frame button. And what it will do, it'll just tell me where the head is going to move. Yeah, well, it jumped well out the way because I forgot to set the origin point. So let me drive it back again to that, that point just there. And now I'll press the origin button and do it properly. Now we'll press frame and there we go, there's my 40 millimeter square. The sort of things that I do instinctively have got to come to you slowly. So <clears throat> the first thing you need to just think about is have I got my air assist on? Yes. Is everything clear? Yes. What, have I, what am I missing? Well, there is one big thing that I'm missing, and that's the extract system. So there we go, we're ready for takeoff. Now, did I cut through? Yes, I did. This frame that's here, this aluminium frame, is, is a reasonable point. I can actually use that almost like a reference square in the corner there. And to make sure that it is square, because the whole table can move around, push it to that back corner over there, and then we should know that the frame is square with the machine basically, and then we can slide this piece of material into that corner there. And then we can drive the head up towards the corner of the material. So I've got my memory stick plugged into the machine and now I'm going to press the file button 
and that will enable me to get to the second menu there so I press this button and we get across to the U disk now I can press the enter button and I get the U disk menu and I need to read the U disk to start with and on here I should find head tag and card tag they were the two files that I need to transfer into this machine so we'll do that while we're here we'll go to head tag and we will then move across copy to memory copy successful enter card tag copy to memory copying enter enter uh, escape okay and there's my card targets in machine memory so now I'm going to go back to file oops escape back to file and now we're going to find on the memory head tag and there it is enter and we're ready to run so we can now press the go button and hopefully we shan't waste any material see how well this is cut. If it's cut well I should be able to just lift this off. Wow that is superb. Now my fear with this honeycomb bed is that it would mark the back of these products. Let me just have a look across this edge here and we'll see whether or not my fears are in any way founded. Well very slightly. But I don't think anything, there's certainly no marks on the back of the product there. And if we look along the edge and I catch it in the light right, let's just see if we can catch it in the light right. Yeah, maybe like that. You probably just can see some little marks on the edge of the material there where you've got little reflections off the honeycomb edge. But if that's as bad as it gets, then I should be very pleased. What my concern was that it would be along the back of the product here. So this particular material is two millimeter extruded acrylic. Now extruded acrylic has got slightly different cutting properties to cast acrylic. Cast acrylic tends to produce a really lovely clean edge with no burrs. This has got a protective film on it. As you can see I'm having a bit of trouble getting the protective film off. But protective film is the thing that I think is stopping it from being damaged um, by reflections off of this surface. And it's done a pretty good job actually. I can't see any, I can't see when I hold that up to the light and catch the light on it. I can't see any marks on there at all from the honeycomb. One, one or two just round here. There are definite marks around the edge but that's nothing, absolutely nothing. There's a little sharp edge all the way around the bottom edge there, which happens with, it's almost like a little burr, which happens with extruded acrylic, and you tend not to get that with cast acrylic. Now the next part of the job involves A4 white card, and that's the website that I got it from. It's 300 gram craft card. I bought this card for manufacturing um, Christmas cards and birthday cards and to be honest it's not very good for doing that sort of work it's a lovely card a lovely stiff card but it's got so much china clay in it that it actually smokes on the surface and it produces not a very good so I use this for all sorts of test work and particularly what we're going to use it for now which is to make these targets so again we can tuck it up in the corner there so we've got a nice reference to work with now you don't need to see me loading the program again because you've already seen it. I've got my program in and loaded now and technically I'm sitting right in the corner of the sheet here but of course this is not two millimetre thick material 
this is only probably about half a millimetre thick. So I really ought to go away and do the autofocus again. So we'll drive the head out into the work area and then we'll use the ZU key and I'll carry out the autofocus procedure again. Okay, done. Now I've got my origin still set in the corner there so technically I don't need to go back and reset my origin. So what I'll do, I will now just do a frame test and the first thing that should happen is the head should drive towards the corner to find the origin and then it will run round and we've got to check that it doesn't run off of the paper anywhere. A little bit tight there, plenty of room there, a little bit of room there. So really we can do and it's tight along the back there. So what we'll do, we'll drive the head forward slightly and in slightly, too much, about there. We'll press the origin button there and then we'll do a frame again and check it again. That's good, that's good. And that looks as though it's tight on that edge there now. So we need to come back just a shade, like that maybe. One more. That bag there is good. Origin, I'm happy with that. So we're just gonna go for it. We'll see what happens. Oh dear, too much power. Look, what's happening? My targets are flowing out. That's no good, is it? Press the pause button, press the escape button. Bit of a disaster really. Let's go and have a look at how we can edit the program on the machine. Right, well, <clears throat> we need to press the escape button to start with, I think, because we're part way through the program. So let's just check. File. Enter. Enter again. And one more time and all of a sudden we get the editing menu down here. For the blue layer, if you remember the blue layer was the target itself. So we need to edit the blue layer. We come down here to the speed. Now I don't think the speed is the issue. To be honest, I think it's really the power. Now I don't know what minimum power, as I said to you, I can actually operate this machine on. Let's take it down to as low as, oh goodness me, there's the reason. Look, a mistake on my part somewhere. 65%, no wonder it cut out. But while we're here, we will edit this power down to, we'll take it down to 10% and we'll see what happens. And then we press the ZU button again and we come down to here and we correct my obvious mistake. Ten percent. Ten percent. Set up success. Enter. There we go, that makes more sense. And I can hear can you hear how hissy that sound is? That tells me I'm using a zone of operation that the tube possesses called high frequency impact engraving. Now, I will explain to you in another session what that's all about. But it makes a lot of noise, as you can hear. That's not bad at all. Now this is why I would never want to use this matrix table for doing card work. If we look down here, you'll see clearly where the beam has passed over one of these, and it's given reflections on the back. They're all over the place, these reflections. For a high quality card, that would be totally unacceptable. You can probably see on the front here what I mean about the smoke effect. This has definitely got a brown tinge to it where it's blown out and across the surface. That's the high china clay content in here which is blowing up. If we get a different sort of paper 
we won't have this problem. And in fact, what I will do is immediately show you the difference between different types of paper cutting. Here we have a paper that I absolutely love to use for card work. As you can see, it's a watercolour paper. And it comes in a thick pad of 100 sheets. And it's just got a lovely sort of a, a texture on the surface. Now, I will just take a piece that I've already used. I think you can probably see that this is a much cleaner cut. There's virtually no browning at all around this cut here. And this would get even better, this cut, if I was to use this high-impact engraving phase which I've got to investigate to find out where its limit is. I like to run card cutting right at the top limit of that particular operating phase for the tube. You heard it operating here at 10%. Well, it may well be that I can get it up to maybe 13, 14% and it will still exist. And in which case I can use it for cutting as well. Okay, well the time has come to start doing something with these pieces. Now the thing that we've got to do with these is to assemble them and we've actually got to glue them together. When I say glue them together, we shall need a special adhesive for bonding acrylic. Now I've got a material here from a company called Bondrite and it is actually a PETG weld cement. Now technically I should have acrylic weld cement but I know that PETG weld cement will do the job. Acrylic cement won't weld PETG, but it will work the other way around for some strange chemical reason. Now this stuff will evaporate very, very quickly, so you need to make sure that you always keep the lid on. They normally give you a little bottle, and what I do is I'll just squeeze the bottle and very slowly release it so that I suck some of the fluid, which is just like water, I think you can probably see I've only got a very small amount in the bottom there. So we pop the needle on the top there like that and now we're ready to begin the assembly. So there's four pieces to this one and four pieces to that one. Now it is actually pretty obvious how these go together. So it's as simple as that. But now what we've got to do is to bond it together. And the way that we do that is we will try and keep our fingers away from the actual uh, little tenon joints and we shall lay this in a horizontal plane and then I don't know whether we can get close enough to see it but when I tip this up very gently the fluid that's in here which is very watery will just flow out and it will actually by a capillary action flow into the joint there it is that's as simple as that it produces a really neat little joint now I've got to hold that for something like about 10 seconds, 15 seconds, just to get it to bond and dry off. And again, I'm going to run this very gently, turn it, just turn it off of horizontal, and then when, the, when it runs, just go straight along the joint. Now after about 15 or 20 seconds, that will have fixed, and then I can run along this joint as well. There, and there. Now, I don't know whether you can see it in this light, but here's the marks that I was talking about along the back edge there on the edge. Those marks haven't affected the surface of the material, but they have actually just impacted along the edge there. That's the reflections off of the honeycomb section. It's not a major issue, it's just interesting that I can see them. Well, there's our first target holder made, and we'll pop our target on there. The target locates here, and so it's re repeatedly sitting in the same position so that we can fire a laser beam at it. But I'm afraid you're going to have to be patient to see that because we've got a few more sessions before we get to doing anything with this. This next item is an interesting item as well. Now I've put these two pieces together like this, and I've produced a, basically what looks like a pocket here. Now you would normally make that out of one thick piece of material and you would mill a pocket in it or you could make this out of a piece of 6mm say acrylic or 5mm acrylic and you could try engraving a sort of a pocket in there but it wouldn't be all that accurate. 
this is a much more accurate way of making that pocket with two pieces. But then you have the problem of how do I stick it together? Well, we have got this stuff, remember, but I'm not going to be using that for main location. What we're using, we're using these pieces. Now these pieces, if you look carefully, we've got tongues on the end, which are twice the thickness of the material. So I'm going to pop those through those slots. It all locates and locks together nicely. Run along this edge here, like that. And then I can run along this edge here like this, as quickly as that. And to be honest, it's nicely held together. If I can manipulate my hand over far enough, which looks as though I might be able to, I could probably run along that one as well, which will save me waiting too many seconds. Now, the only other thing that we've got to do is this piece here is a little bit on the, a little bit on the flimsy side. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to run a bead of glue along that joint there. Well, that's the end of our first programming and our production project. Now these items will be used at a future date and we've got a couple more that we're going to manufacture that will be used in conjunction with these during one long session for checking the performance of the machine so that we've benchmarked the machine.